Welcome to the May 2021 episode of the Family Tree Magazine podcast. I'm Lisa Louise Cook. In this episode, we're going to talk with the author of a new online article at FamilyTreeMagazine.com. It's called Tips for Finding Your Indentured Servant Ancestors. Now, many Americans don't realize that they descend from indentured servants, but author Sumner Honeywell is going to be here to explain how you can find out if you are. And then we'll sit down for a chat with Diane Souther to talk about what to do when your DNA results don't match who you thought you were. In our Best Websites for Genealogy segment, Ellen Schindelman Coet is here to share some of the best websites for Jewish genealogy. These come straight from her article, Find Your Jewish Roots Online, which is featured in the May 2021 issue of Family Tree Magazine. And Family Tree Magazine's own e-learning producer, Amanda Epperson, is here to talk about some of the terrific genealogy courses that are going to be starting soon over at Family Tree University. There's a lot of great stuff to cover, so let's kick things off by hearing what you have to say, and we'll do that in Tree Talk. There are several big genealogy subscription websites out there. And Family Tree Magazine social digital editor Rachel Fountain has been making some inquiries on social media to find out which ones you think are the best investment. Welcome back to the podcast, Rachel. Hi, Lisa. Thanks for having me. So, Rachel, um, tell us a little bit more about the question that you posed and what kind of answers you got from the readers. Sure. That's one of the great things about um, social media is that it allows us to connect with our readers and hear about what's going on in their research and makes it more of a two-way street, which is cool. And we're always curious about, you know, what strategies and tools people are using and, you know, what's working for them and, and helping them um, in their research. So recently we asked on Facebook and Twitter, which of the major subscription websites have been the best investment for your research? And people sounded off with some good answers in the comments. Um, I'm here on Facebook and our follower, Donna Anderson, she said, it depends where your focus is. I get a lot of typical info from ancestry. I haven't done as well with American ancestors. And then she goes on to say that my heritage has been great for her because she is involved in Swedish research. And then she also mentioned the site Archive Digital for deeper Swedish research. So I think that's a great point. I think, you know, the website that works the best for you will not necessarily be maybe the most popular or the biggest, but it will be the one that aligns the best with your research goals. So I think she made a great point. Yeah, I do too, because I think that uh, each one of them kind of has those areas of strength. They, they just can't have everything in all areas. So uh, Mm -hmm. yeah, that's a really good point. And we can always use the free trials and and do a quick browse to see if they have the kind of stuff that we need. Definitely. And people went on to mention a lot of the main uh, genealogy websites, you know, ones that we're all familiar with ancestry, find my past, but There was a favorite in the comment section, and that was newspapers.com. Let's see, our follower, Michelle A. Johnson, she said, I've gotten so much information from family obituaries that I find on newspapers.com. So that was, I don't want to say unexpected, but it was cool to see how many people found newspapers.com useful and the resources they have there. So yeah, it's a great example of a of a website that doesn't try to do everything, but really does as much as it possibly can in one record type, which Mm -hmm. is newspapers. So, uh, and of course, if they have the ones you need, (laughs) I always say that, you know, (laughs) the best newspaper website is the one that has the paper you need. So, right. That, that is an excellent point. Well, great. So this was over at Facebook and people can join the family tree magazine, Facebook group. You can go to facebook.com slash family tree magazine so Rachel, you're out there having these, uh, these uh, great conversations with other genealogists out on social media. How can our listeners get involved in that? They can get involved by following us on Facebook and Twitter um, and our other socials as well. I'll leave those links in the show notes, of course. And I'll also leave links to these um, discussion questions specifically. So if you want to hop in and um, sound off with what subscription website you feel like has been the best investment for your research dollars, you can go ahead and do that. Excellent. They might even see that in the pages of the Tree Talk column in the, oh, yes. the magazine as well, correct? Yes, that's true. Tree Talk is the name we give to 
um, all of our conversations with our readers. So yes, they will see your responses in there as well. Love it. Okay. Well, those of you listening, if you're on Facebook, grab your phone right now, tap the Facebook app and go to search for Family Tree Magazine and uh, join the conversation over there as well. Rachel, always great to talk to you and we'll look forward to hearing next month's question. Sounds great. Thanks, Lisa. In centuries past, not everyone who wished to come to America could afford it. And as a result, indentured servants were common in American settlements. They worked a set period of time for a master in exchange for things like passage on a ship or their room and board. And if you've been wondering if by chance you have ancestors in your family tree who were indentured servants, or maybe you found one and uh, you'd like to learn more and find out how to go about researching them, my guest today can help. Sumner G. Honeywell is the former president of the National Society, Descendants of Colonial Indentured Servants. He is the author of the Family Tree Magazine online article. It's called Tips for Finding Your Indentured Servant Ancestors. Welcome to the show, Sumner. Well, thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. You've been involved in uh, this kind of research for quite a, a long time, haven't you? And been involved with that society. Um, I've been interested in genealogy since I was a teenager. So that was in the 1970s. And really, in the last five years or so, I've come back and have dug a lot harder on my ancestry. And, and finding some indentured servants was sort of an exciting thing because um, we, we don't usually think of anybody coming over for that reason. You know, usually we're thinking someone's coming over, they're paying their way, uh, or they have family here, or what have you. And in many cases, these folks didn't. Exactly. Tell us a little bit more about how a person became an indentured servant and also what kind of time frame are we talking about? Sure. Um, indentured servitude actually went up until the, in the 1800s. So, um, but even the earliest settlers that came over in Jamestown, there were scores of indentured servants that were shipped at one point in time. Uh, the people on the Mayflower of the 104 passengers, um, 14 were indentured servants. So they were essentially the idea being that I can't afford passage. I'm willing to go to a new world and find some advantage. It would, be, it would have to be advantageous to me, uh, not only the, the two month voyage and the ship, which you might not survive. Also the fact that I'm, I'm going to be going someplace where it's, it's sort of like home. <laughs> it's definitely not quite like home. I mean, you're, you're in, in a lot of places, you're just starting from scratch. When you think about some of the earliest settlers, they were, um, you know, they had to make their own homes. They had no ancestry where they're living in mom and dad's house or they've got assistance from family and things. So um, these guys were really taking a big chance coming over, but the rewards could be great. Exactly. They didn't know what they were getting into. And um, you said it, it goes very far back, I assume, back well into the 1600s. Uh, you said the, the Mayflower, certainly, but even more recently. So um, they might be looking for passage. Would there be other reasons, like somebody was a prisoner and they have an option to, to do indentured right. servitude or they can go to prison? Right. So so there were, there were some men that were... Uh, uh, for example, they were rebellious to the King of England. Uh, there were Scots. And so uh, after the Battle of Dunbar, and there was another battle as well, they had the choice of either prison, which is bleak and miserable, or they could be indentured and go over uh, overseas. Usually, if they did that, um, it, was, it was still not... Uh, it, it, at least they had a future, uh, uh, but it wasn't pleasant. I mean, uh, we hear about the people that went to the Saugus uh, Ironworks and then others went up to uh, Saugus, Massachusetts, and then others went up to Kittery, Maine. Um, and they had maybe the, you know, they're working 12 hours uh, or 16 hours a day. They're working six days a week. So they were, they were pretty much worked to death. Uh, and some of them certainly were worked to death. Uh, but uh, rotting away in a prison for an indeterminate amount of time wasn't good either. So they, I mean, there's some people had a choice of doing that. Uh, other people fled because of uh, 
maybe religious persecution. Um, others fled because where they were there, they were not going to be able to get ahead. Um, you know, you're the third son of the third son. And so maybe you get a brass pot and three shillings and that's, that's your inheritance. But maybe if I go over to Massachusetts Bay or if I uh, go to Virginia, I'll have an opportunity to get land and it will be my land um, I won't be working off uh, somebody else's land. Um, I won't be a tenant farmer or anything like that. And so you have an opportunity there to uh, sort of be the Lord, you know, your own Lord of your manor, even if it's just 10 acres out in the middle of the woods, uh, it's still yours. So. Exactly. So there was lots to gain. What though was some of the price of that? What are some of, what's an example of kind of the arrangements that they would have in how long they might have to serve a master. So the arrangement, an indenture is essentially a contract. And in many cases, you would have a copy of the contract and your master would have a copy of the contract. And you would say, I will serve for three years or I will serve for five or I will serve for seven years. And at the end of that contract, I will get something. Um, I'm, in some cases, it might be, I get a new pair of clothes it might be I get land. It could be money, um, but it was it was an agreement. But also, as as part of that, you as as a master, you had to hold up your end of the bargain. You had to make sure the guy was fed and housed and, and clothed. And and your part as the servant was to make sure that you did what you were expected to do over that period of time. And because it was a contract, you could apply for redress, right? You could go to the court systems and say, um, this guy ran away. It cost me 10 pounds to bring him back. I want another year of service out of him uh, to pay for this. Or alternatively, um, maybe you're an indentured servant and you signed up for seven years and some guy is trying to squeeze another year out of you. In some cases, the indentured servants couldn't read. So, you're up to, you know, the mercy of the guy who's holding the other piece of paper. Um, but the courts, because it was a contract, the courts could get involved. And um, there's, uh, there's a resource online of Pennsylvania indentured servants who essentially went and said, you know, he's breaking the contract. <laughs> and so they wanted, you know, he's not giving me my clothes or, he, or he's not feeding me three meals a day or what have right. And so the expectation it, it went on both sides. Some people would come and they would stay for a while and they would run away. Um, there are a lot of uh, books out there about runaway indentured servants, probably more in the 1700s, I think, than early on. And they actively pursued those. I know when I uh, visited the website of the society, you know, there were old newspaper articles, people looking for somebody mm -hmm. who, who run away. Um, and I think I've seen different stories where lots of situations where they found ways to say, no, nope, you owe me another three years now. No, nope, you owe me. I mean, th that was a kind of a thing too, right? Right. So the, yeah, you, you have to be, they had to be careful. I mean, with any sort of uh, contract or whatever, or even the, 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 uh, uh, the distance you are from people can make an effect. I mean, if you're out in the big piney woods you may not have the ability to go to courts. Courts might be, you know, 50 miles away. Um, and then your master can treat you any way he wants. So right. there, were, there was, there was opportunity for abuse on both sides. And yes, the, you can see these old great newspaper articles from it seems Philadelphia in particular, where they have runaway slave, uh, not runaway slave, but runaway servant. Uh, he's uh He's 5'4", uh, he likes to gamble, he's got brown hair, blue eyes, he's got a scar, he's pockmarked or whatever, and, and they would try to capture these guys. Right. Now, you mentioned men, but were women and children also sometimes indentured servants? Oh, oh absolutely, yes. So, so some women would be indentured, and sometimes uh, women as well, uh, you would, sometimes it was a matter of later on after more and more immigrants came here, you had more skilled immigrants. You might have a seamstress that comes over from Germany or somebody who comes over from the Isle of Man or, or what have you. 
and they this guy is a, a a goldsmith you get some very you know you had a a population that could afford some finer things than just raw labor and they would people would come over and they would be able to uh, say well i need a seamstress and you might have a boatload of these skilled laborers coming over and they would sell their services to the highest bidder. So if you need a seamstress, you know, how much are you willing to pay? And then that woman would be uh, in that family and doing that work for whatever the situation was involved. So it wasn't always that you brought somebody over and you knew who they were going to be. Sometimes you had people that were the middlemen that were bringing over these, these uh, talented people to work for people. Um, in the case of children, you ran into situations where uh, maybe the father died and the mother could not take care of the children. At that point in time, a widow was usually uh, in, in dire straits because she had no, unless she brought something into the marriage, she didn't have any right to the land or anything else that her husband had. Um, so in, in some cases, the children would be farmed out to learn a trade. So it's like, we'll send this guy out and he'll learn how to make barrels or he'll learn how to be a rope maker or something along those lines. And the children would be signed up until they reached the age of majority. And at that point in time, they were um, expected to be able to pursue that, pursue that thing. Um and sometimes the t- if they're, the child was an orphan, they, the town would farm them out to a family. But in, and again, you still had that same situation where the family was expected to clothe the child and raise the child. And um, you can see where this, like, you know, you will teach him how to read the Bible. Mm-hmm. He will teach, you know, he will go worship on Sunday. Um, he will have clothes and these types of things that there was still an expectation. You couldn't treat the, the child like dirt, um, you had to treat them, treat them well. You had to, you had to give them that opportunity to learn a trade. I can only imagine how challenging that was though, to actually follow up on and make sure that things were happening the way they were supposed to be. It was definitely a, um, a risk taking experience for everybody, I think involved. Um, so let's talk about, you know, if somebody wanted to get started and, and they've maybe caught wind that, oh, I do have somebody who looks like they were an indentured servant at one point, where would you encourage them to begin their search? Um, some Usually what you'll do is you'll find references to land being given to servants, or um, you might find, so usually you'll find things in court records, things along those lines. Wills or another place, sometime Uncle Joe dies and he has two indentured servants and, and he can do a few things with those things. He can say, I'm giving them something when I die and the rest of their time. Or they may say, I'm giving the rest of his time to my wife. And so you know, he'll work his ex, you know, out of the two out of the last seven years or whatever, he'll work for my wife doing whatever he was supposed to do or she was supposed to do. Um, so wills are another place where you can find things out. Um, clues that you'll see where they mentioned manservant or woman servant or maid servant, uh, things along those lines are helpful. Usually when you see them being given something for their effort, then that's a clue as to that they were probably an indentured servant. Um, I, I think the idea is like, well, can I just go out and find an indenture? They're really hard to find find the actual documentation, things like that. I think when you, it's easier to find those things as we get closer and closer to the present time, the 1800s, 1700s, late 1700s, you may be able to find those, but the early 1600s, I think would be, be hard unless they were a list of men, right? Like we'd said about the, the battle of Denbar, where it says, these are the men who came over on this ship and they're being farmed out to this guy at this particular place to expect it to work there for five or seven or three years or whatever. Sounds like you're really, um, you have to kind of know the time frame to know what kind of contractual arrangements were getting made, what kind of records are being generated. It's very different than when we're researching the 19th century or the 20th century. So uh, you mentioned contractual arrangements like um, land, 
or you mentioned the the wills and that type of thing. Are there any um, resource books? Are there books and series of um, that might kind of shed light on that time frame and and that area? Uh, right. Actually, if you go out, uh, there's an indenturedservants.org website. That's our okay. society's website, and we have a list of resources. There's there's two sets. One are documents that we have come across some online resources, uh, but also in there are the resources that were used to prove our members' descent from an indentured servant. So you, it may be a family history where it says, you know, this guy came over, he was indentured, and they may have some information there that you might not be able to find elsewhere. So I think that that's really helpful and so you, you've got your, for what I would crowdsourcing probably isn't the right word, but the idea that you have a hundred different people using probably 75 different sources to prove that their ancestor was an indentured servant. So right. um, as more people come on board, that gets updated as, as soon as they're, they're approved. So that, that's probably a good place to start. Exactly. Well, and your article is a really good place to start. It's called Tips for Finding Your Indentured Servant Ancestor. Um, It's one of the premium articles over at FamilyTreeMagazine.com. And uh, as you mentioned, the indenturedservants.org website. What a wonderful resource for anybody who's kind of exploring this area of their family tree. Mm -hmm. Uh, Sumner, thank you so much for kind of just giving us a great overview and a lead on some wonderful resources for our research. I appreciate it. Oh, sure. My pleasure. Happy to. It's getting more and more common these days to come across news stories about people who found their life turned upside down by DNA testing. In today's DNA Deconstructed segment, Diane said it's going to help us navigate those unexpected results. Welcome back, Diane. Thanks for having me, Lisa. And thanks for bringing up this really sensitive topic that I know more and more people are experiencing. Yeah, even if it hasn't happened to them, they may know somebody that it has happened to. And I know that you wrote about uh, this topic of unexpected DNA results recently in the uh, DNA Q&A column that's over on FamilyTreeMagazine.com. And I think the article was called, My DNA Doesn't Match Who I Thought I Was. Now what? And I'm guessing uh, that this has probably come up with your clients as well in your own consulting business. So what advice do you give people when wow, these DNA results are not what you thought. Perhaps um, a parent isn't your biological parent or a sibling is not your sibling. Tell us about that. Yeah, no, it can be really hard to take. I've had many experiences with this. Um, As you said, consulting one-on-one with people, but also just at conferences, someone will hear a lecture that I give. I, I had one experience where a lady came up to me afterwards. She goes, oh, I just loved your lecture. And I learned so much. And I just wanted to ask you about this DNA match that I don't recognize. And they, you know, show me their phone that has their DNA match list on it. And there is a half sibling and they're totally innocently looking back at me, just earnestly wondering who this person is. And I'm in a room full of people and oh, you know, it's really hard. And, and I have to say, Hey, let's, let's talk about this a little bit later. <laughs> let's <laughs> let me finish up here and let's, you know, go somewhere in private because you know, there, the match is right there. And for many people that match has been there for months or even years, and they've just been not really sure who it is or what to do about it, or, or not even recognizing how close it is. And so um, there, there is that shock that happens initially, <laughs> certainly, uh, when you learn something like this. Um, and, and I think it's really important to recognize that it is shock, and that mm-hmm. you probably shouldn't act on anything right away. <laughs> just good let advice. It <laughs> right? Because the things that we do and say immediately after may not reflect what we would want to have done had we thought about it more. And so that's my first piece of advice is wait, let it sink in and verify. I've also talked with other people who have come at conferences and they've said, oh, well, my cousin and I do genealogy together and we're looking at this match and she thinks this person is so-and-so. And so I talked to my dad and he said he never had a child and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, whoa, let's just let me look at this. Right. And then they show it to me and it's not at all what they thought. Oh, um, right. You know, there, there, there are situations where you see a mystery match on your DNA match list and there's another explanation and, and they've, they've 
misconstrued the information and they've gone and accused someone already of being the parent or grandparent of someone. And that's not the situation at all. And so, yeah, understand that there's a shock and wait and then verify, verify that the information that you think that you have is correct with someone who's totally emotionally disconnected from the situation. So whether that's somebody in your, maybe you have a special interest group in your genealogy society for DNA, go ask someone in your special interest group. Or of course there's experts like me or or a lot of others who are out there who are qualified to just counsel you on exactly what DNA match you actually have. But so that's the second step is verify that the information that you think you have really is what it is, right? Exactly. Well, and if you were going to approach somebody, you'd want to have your ducks in a row more than just a glance at your screen. But really, here's why I think I've, I've confirmed that this is the case. And it's interesting, you know, you were saying about taking your time. I mean, all these years, they didn't know up until this moment. So what's the rush, right? What's the rush? Exactly. And, and, and and you will always be grateful that you waited and that you took the time. Another thing you can do is, is once you've kind of gathered the information, you've taken some time yourself to process it is to bring in that confidant, whether that's your sibling or, you know, somebody else that's in the family that can help you decide how to move forward with the situation. So for example, if you see this half sibling in your family tree and you know, it's your half sibling, you'd want to then go to the, the parent that you believe is shared. If your parents are still alive, before you talk to anyone else in your family, you go directly to the source. That's so important. Don't go bring in your sister or your brother even, or certainly don't bring in the other parent, right? You go to the, the source and you say, hey, here's what I think that I found. Can we talk about this and have that situation worked out between just the two of you? And then ultimately you let that parent decide how to move forward. Now, if everybody's passed away and you're finding this out at you know much later in your life, then I think it does help to bring in a sibling, a confidant, somebody that you can say, oh my goodness, look what we found. How should we move forward? What do you think we should do? And, and it's okay then to bring someone into your confidence and, and counsel with them about how to handle this in the greater sense of your family. That's really good advice. I know some people, uh, when I've talked to them, they've actually been kind of excited. Oh my gosh, there's this whole new branch, but not everybody will necessarily share your excitement based on how it impacts them. And I thought it was interesting, you know, the question that uh, you had received that you talked about in the article was about, I'm not who I thought I was. And of course, I imagine that there's just to take a deep breath and reassure them, you're exactly who you are. <laughs> you just have more information, right? I mean, I would think Absolutely. That- yeah. Thanks for bringing us back around to this question. If it's happening to you specifically, then it is important to remember that your genetics are just one piece of who you are. Yeah. They are a piece and it is worth exploring and understanding what that piece means, but that doesn't mean you have to disregard all of the culture and the memories and everything that you've had. I feel like so many people, when they find out, for example, their father's not their father, they feel like all of the memories they have with the man who raised them are somehow tainted or Mm -hmm. not real or something. And that's not true at all. Those experiences are, are all real. That relationship is real. That love is real. Those are our, our relationships to treasure. And I, I hope that people can see these discoveries, not as chopping off a branch of your tree, but grafting in a new branch. You don't ever lose branches of your tree. You're just gaining branches. It's not all about biology. It is about family is about culture and relationships and memories. I mean, you're not biologically related to your spouse and yet you would never think they weren't part of your family, right? Biology isn't everything. Exactly. And there's so much more to it. In fact, all the memories and things you're talking about, those are all the things we crave to find in our own genealogy research. And so just adding more makes it a richer story all the way around. Well, very good advice. And of course, uh, you can learn more from Diane Sutter over to her website, yourdnaguide.com. And I'll have a link in the show notes for this episode, um, this May of 2021 episode of the Family Tree Magazine podcast. Uh, The link will take you over to that article, My DNA Doesn't Match, Who I Thought I Was, Now What? Uh, Diane's always got great advice, and we look forward to talking to you next month as well, Diane. Thanks so much. Thanks, Lisa. In today's Best Website segment, 
We're going to take a look at some of the best websites for finding your Jewish roots online. And here to tell us more about it is Ellen Schindelman Coet. Now, she's the director of Jewish Gens USA Research Division, and she's the national vice chair of a DAR specialty research Jewish task force. And she's also the author of the article, Find Your Jewish Roots Online, and it's featured in the May 2021 issue of Family Tree Magazine. Welcome to the show, Ellen. Thank you, Lisa. I'm happy to be here. Really happy to have you here. This was a terrific article. I mean, so many wonderful resources. And, you know, I was thinking when I think of Jewish genealogy, immediately my mind goes to JewishGen.org. Sure. Um, and I was hoping maybe you could just start us off with an overview of that, because I know that you're involved with them. And boy, do they have a lot to offer. Yeah. So Jewish Gen is really the premier main source for Jewish records on the internet today. And they've developed some really great data sets that can be searched for free by anyone. There's no charge to search Jewish Gen. Um, similar to Family Search, they ask that you register for a username and a password. And then they have different tools they've developed that are unique to searching Jewish records. So I think there are a lot of entry points into Jewish Gen. They have a unified search which kind of combines the data sets from hundreds of records into one search function because you can search each of these data sets separately. But if you're just browsing or curious and you just wanna throw your names in, the unified search is a great place to start. You'll put your name or your town name into the search engine. There's a, a form with fields that you can populate. And it doesn't matter if you're spelling the names of your given name or your surname or your town name even correctly, because you're gonna be able to pick a couple of different ways to search in a drop down menu. My recommendation is always search on sounds like and phonetically like, because those are the Deitch Mokotov and Bader Morse Jewish algorithms for Jewish names and places. Um, a second point about Jewish Gen that's so helpful, they have a communities database that lists, I think, over 6,000 places where Jews mostly lived in the largest populations um, around Eastern Europe. And in many of those places, Jews don't live there anymore, but they'll outline for you during different time periods where the records are or where they were. So like a part of what the, we always refer to Jews coming from Russia because we see that on passenger manifests or census records. But a lot of times when you see Russia as a place of origin for a Jewish family, if they came before 1917, that was Russian empire. Russian empire doesn't exist anymore. And what was the Russian empire pre 1795 is not Russia proper today. So there are a lot of countries where your family could have come from, including Poland, because part of Poland was in the Russian Empire, that your family might actually be from Lithuania or Latvia or Belarus or Ukraine, or even some places in the South that don't exist anymore. There used to be an area referred to as Bessarabia and another one of Bukovina. These don't exist anymore. Even Prussia, when you talk about the German Jews who came over, um, and this is true for non-Jews coming from Prussia too. There's no Prussian empire anymore. And what was the Prussian empire is now largely Poland, parts of Russia, Germany, of course. Um, but it's misleading that if your family spoke German and said they were Prussian, that they were German the way we think of Germany today. And a lot of Jews came from Prussia. So that's why I mention it. So those are kind of the key things about Jewish Gen. That's an amazing resource. What other types of websites might be out there for regional Jewish genealogy? Yeah, so it's a little confusing. There's a, a kind of a hierarchy. It's not coordinated by any um, like organizing body, but there are three independently run Jewish uh, database sites. And when I say the names, sometimes people say, oh, well, that's a part of Jewish gen. They're not, they're run independently. Okay. So the three are um, JRI Poland, which stands for Jewish Records Indexing Poland, uh, Gesher Galicia, and I'll define that area for you, and um, what we used to call Litvak SIG, and a SIG stands for Special Interest Group. 
So all three of these groups kind of had roots in Jewish Gen and then for different organizing reasons, all wanted to organize as independent nonprofits, but they share their data. Now, do they share all of their data? Do they share their data at the same time? Are they sharing it in the same place? The answers really vary. So this is why I always say, if you're brand new, check out the unified search on Jewish Gen. Ancestry actually has some of Litback SIG, some of JRI Poland, and some of Jewish Gen's records. And just recently, Litback SIG released some of their records to my heritage. So there are there's some overlap back and forth on the data sets, but if you're from these three particular geographic regions, I wouldn't only be looking on Ancestry Family Search and Jewish Gen. I would always go to the original databases on each of their original websites. So Litback SIG really stands for Lithuania, but Lithuania today is different than the geographic borders of Lithuania 100 years ago. So if, when you look at modern day Lithuania on a map, if your family's coming from a part of Latvia or Belarus or an area of Russia, just kind of that surrounds that area, you might want to look there. I have this corner of Southwestern Lithuania that a town, a part of my family came from, but it has also been Prussian. It has been Suwaki, Poland, and it's right near Belarus, but yet I found records in Lithuania and Litvak SIG. I've also found them in Suwaki for JRI Poland. So loosely when you define your location, consider what's geographically around the modern day borders. But Litvak SIG is predominantly Lithuania and a lot of Jews came from Vilnius and Kaunas and all these places up there. The second one is JRI Poland. So this group, they're fantastic in their records acquisition. They've had partnerships with the Polish State Archives. They give locations of microfilm that are um, for Polish municipalities at the Family Search Digital Collection. And they have tons of volunteers who've worked for 30 years. So it's extremely extensive. Um, for listeners that don't know, the Polish State Archives has largely gone online. So a lot of vital records are digitized and you can go right to the record. Now it may be in Polish or Russian, but you can get to those records for free just like you can on Family Search sometimes. So JRI Poland is just a powerhouse for getting access, using their indexes first to locate if there are records for your family in a town, using the sound X's that are the Jewish sound X's, and then getting to the original record. So I just love JRI Poland and be loose on those borders because it's gonna include Suwaki and those areas north on the Lithuanian Russian border, even the Belarus border, that Prussian border on the other side. So for JRI Poland, cast a broad net of something, areas that were ever considered Poland, even on the Southern side too. And then the third one is called Gesher Galicia, also run independently, also shares data with um, Jewish Gen. Galicia does not exist anymore. It was a designation for an area, what today you would think of on a map as Western Ukraine and Eastern Poland. And a lot of Jews lived in Galicia. Unique to that area is that it was Austro-Hungarian empire at one point. So the records are in German, not so much in Russian or in Polish. But Gesher Galicia has got a fantastic search engine on their database. And they're another powerhouse just continuing with their volunteer army of adding so many great data sets. They're really good too at uh, allowing you to list what towns you're researching if you join. And I think they have a small membership fee. In fact, each of them have a membership fee that they've added on. And I think that just gives you access to records maybe a little bit sooner. But these three often lumped in with Jewish Gen, but really organized as separate organizations and they acquire records and index them in a different way. That's a great, a great overview. Oh mm -hmm. gosh. Okay. Now another area I can think of as a roadblock area for folks in their research is around the Holocaust. Yeah. So what kinds of resources do we have to conduct research when it comes to the Holocaust? So it used to be, you know, I started doing this about 25 years ago and either the records were not released by some of the archives in Russia or in the East, or they weren't in English. 
um, or they weren't indexed. And so you would put in these requests and it would take literally years for certain repositories to answer just a basic inquiry, yes or no, we have a card on your family. Right. And I think there was a lot of mythology built around you can't document the Holocaust and what happened to people. And what we're finding all these years later is there are so many records, plenty of people are documenting their families we are continuing to find more resources available online, even from repositories that are traditionally not in English. It's hard to say where to start because the story of the Holocaust has also evolved. You know, it used to be we'd learn in school, if we even learned at all about the story of the Holocaust, that it was the story of the concentration camps and the Jews being gassed. And that's certainly true. But there's so many other elements of the Holocaust, like the story of the one and a half million Jews killed in Ukraine before anyone ever was killed at Auschwitz. Mm. We call this the Holocaust by bullets. And the story and most of what was the Soviet Union at that time was that Jews were rounded out up and they, this is gruesome, but they were executed and left in mass graves that are unmarked largely throughout what was the Soviet Union. And so, even Jews who knew their family were tied up in those kind of stories um, thought there's no way to figure out what happened or where, you know, what happened to my family or the town. Right. But we do have records. The Russians kept records. It turns out the Germans kept records. And a lot of this has become available online that you can search in English. So it really depends for a family that knows they have a Holocaust story where they were, what country they were originated in. If you know the story that they went to a camp or if they were in a small town where there was a mass grave, you're gonna be looking at very different resources. I would say if you only had to look at one and you wanted to just start this process, Yad Vashem and Israel's website in English would be the place to do a general top level search. And the reason is because Yad Vashem is like the version of, we have the US Holocaust Museum in DC and they have resources too. But the one in Israel is called Yad Vashem and it's got a larger collection. And they've also collected these pages of testimony from survivors who talk about their family members and where they last saw them or if they know the exact story about where what happened to them or their whereabouts throughout the war. And thousands of these pages have been submitted and they're searchable. And you can see the original pages that people submit and you can even get in contact with the people submitting them. So it's a great networking opportunity for people looking to connect. Well, we'll have uh, all those resources that you've been mentioning in the show notes. I really appreciate you sharing all these wonderful resources. And of course, folks can visit you at your website, Ellen Coitz, K-O-W-I-T-T.com. And I know that you uh, do lecturing and, and all kinds of, as you said, professional work on genealogy. And uh, the article, wonderful article, Find Your Jewish Roots, online in the May-June 2021 issue of Family Tree Magazine. Ellen, it's been a delight to talk to you. Thank you so much for joining us here on the show. Thank you so much for having me. I enjoyed it. Before we wrap up this podcast and this time together, let's head over to the editor's desk where I see Amanda Epperson, the e-learning producer, and she's waiting for us. Hi, Amanda. Hi, I'm waiting very patiently to tell you all about the exciting courses that are coming up in June and July. Awesome. Well, I was wondering what you've been working on, and I, I'm, I know that there are some new things in the works. Tell us about it. We have eight really great courses coming up in June and July. And what I think is really neat about um, our three ethnic heritage courses is each is moderated by the person who wrote the corresponding book. So David Frixell, who wrote the Family Tree Guide to Scandinavian Genealogy, will be doing the Scandinavian course in June. Lisa Alzo, who wrote the Polish, Czech, and Slovak guide, will be teaching the Czech and Slovak course also in June. And then Melanie Holtz, who wrote the Family Tree uh, Italian Genealogy Guide, will be teaching the Italian course in July. Boy, that's really a treat, you know, to have the, the expert on the topic who's written the book and, and they're there in the discussion forum. I know I enjoy that when I'm teaching because as people are going through the class, these questions are popping up that they didn't even know they had. And they have that opportunity to talk to the person who wrote the book and wrote the course. 
Yes, I think that's really special to get that interaction with the author <laughs> and also someone who's a really great researcher and is taking the time to answer your questions thoughtfully. And speaking of how much you enjoy the discussion boards, you are also teaching Google search success for genealogy coming up at the end of July. Yes, and I'm looking forward to that because, you know, that's one, I swear, we could probably revise it each year. I mean, it's going to be fresh for this year. And that's because some things have changed and we just have to keep up to speed on it so we get the most out of it. So I'm, I'm looking forward to teaching that. That is the internet constantly changing is one of the new truisms of life, just like death and taxes. It's also in your Google search success that I got one of my favorite tips for searching on the internet. And that is when you're searching for YouTube videos, don't just search for your ancestor, search for like where they lived or organizations they belong to because someone who posted a video of their ancestor might actually have your ancestor in it, even though they're not the main subject. Awesome. You did take my class. And that, <laughs> that's one of my favorites too, you know, because b people worry, they'll think, well, no, I don't need to look on YouTube because I don't have famous people, but they don't have to be famous. And we learn so we can see it. I love it. I love being able to see the events, the places and, and all those things. And uh, YouTube's a great place to go. Awesome. I bet you pick up a lot of tips and things because you're going through these classes as well, aren't you? Yes, I look, you know, through them, you know, every time they're offered to double check URLs, because again, the internet changes all the time. Uh -huh. And so I'm constantly learning new tips and tricks, some of which I just think are fascinating, like the importance of the time period of 1865 to 1870 for African American research to find out where your ancestors were between that time period to try and get them back to where they lived during the Civil War. And that doesn't even, as far as I know, apply to my own family. But the thing is, I often learn so much, I'm on to the next course, and I've forgotten that tip. <laughs> and I'm on to the new tip, like um, the importance of community cookbooks it's from Gina Ortega's um, Make a Family History Cookbook course, where if you look in community cookbooks, your ancestors may have contributed to one and you could find an old family recipe in there. I can attest to that. I've had success with that. In fact, Amanda, one time I was speaking at a conference and I'm talking about this family and a woman came up afterward and she gave me, well, she told me, I'm going to mail you one. And she did. She had a cookbook from that town and it named, uh, had recipes that I was looking for from Bill, my husband, Bill's ancestors. And she says, somebody gave it to me, but you should have this. So, I mean, it's amazing. It was really fun to see uh, and see women's names in there. You know, a lot of times mm -hmm. we don't get as many women in the records. And so no. that's really cool. Oh, mm -hmm. awesome tips. Okay, so we've got the three new the three uh, ethnic courses coming up. Of course, I'll mm -hmm. have links in the show notes for everybody mm -hmm. listening so that you can join in on the conversation and the learning. There's always something going on at Bama Tree University. Thank you so much, Amanda. We, we're looking forward to it. You're welcome. And I hope to see you soon in a Family Tree University course. Gosh, time flies when you're having fun talking genealogy, but it doesn't have to stop with this episode. Check out all the past episodes in any of your favorite podcasting apps. And of course, while you're there, we'd love it if you would uh, take a moment and give us a positive review. That really helps other genealogists find the show. And as always, you can find everything that we talked about in this episode at our show notes page. Go to familytreemagazine.com slash podcast. And I'm Lisa Louise Cook, and you can find me over at genealogygems.com, where you'll also find the Genealogy Gems podcast and my free weekly YouTube show, Elevenses with Lisa. Until next time, have fun climbing your family tree.